sources. So let's maybe segue into light sources and dosimetry. Now, dosimetry and light sources, uh, the mechanisms behind photobiomodulation are not so controversial in the literature. People are pretty well understanding how this is working. We've been working and looking at it for over 50 years now. The most controversial aspect is what light do you use and how much do you use it? What are the settings? And what you're going to see in just a few minutes is that it gets pretty complex and now you've got to go back to grade school and start doing some math, right? And so there's two parts of dose symmetry. The one is the instrument, the second is the dose. So instrument generates power or irradiance and this is designated by watts per square centimeter. However, the dose is energy, or also called fluence, which is joules per centimeter squared. So watts per centimeter squared versus joules per centimeter squared. And we're going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between irradiance and fluence. So when you're looking at an instrument, there's four factors you want to consider. The wavelength, the power, the coherence, and the pulse structure. So the wavelength is going to tell you what tissue, or you're going to ask yourself what tissue do you want to treat. The power is going to say uh, how much tissue do you want to treat. The coherence is going to say, well, should I use a light emitting diode or should I use a laser? And the pulse structure is important because it's going to help you consider some of your power calculations and your dose calculations. So here's a diagram that I kind of put together for you that really summarizes a lot of what people are talking about right now. I want to draw your attention to the right side of the screen where it goes from uh, the 400 nanometer spectrum all the way down to the 1100, excuse me, on the left side of the screen, then transition over to the right side of the screen where you're going to see the chromophore that is affected by that specific uh, wavelength. So when we start looking in the 400 to 700 spec um, nanometer spectrum, your target tissue is melanin. So when you're in the tanning bed, that's at the higher end, right? That's 400 spectrum, ultraviolet, hemoglobin, and myoglobin. So really, really important if you're looking at superficial types of injuries, when you're looking at tissue repair, when you're looking at aches and pains and blood flow and inflammation. And then there's a gap of what the research is pretty well determined is completely unusable wavelength between 700 and 750 plus or minus about 15 nanometers of, of light. And it just doesn't seem to be really absorbed by anything, maybe a little bit by melanin and a little bit by hemoglobin, but it doesn't really have a therapeutic consequence. And then from 750 on, our primary chromophore is the cytochrome C oxidase, which is going to give us more ATP, all of those amazing things that we just talked about. And as you go farther down the list there, you start seeing that the major chromophore becomes water. This is why you put something dry in the microwave and you put it on for five minutes and it doesn't do anything. Because as you start going down that spectrum, water seems to be the chromophore, what's absorbing most of that energy. So what that means, if water is the chromophore in those spectrum, there's something we need to be considerate of. And what is that? Heating. Okay, so heat becomes an issue. But we also said that heating can be a good thing because there are heat-gated channels on these cells that allow us to have action potentials, that allow us to create ATP and protein kinases, all of these different things. So, and we also have to look at some of the depth. So let's go across the x-axis where we look at more of the, and it's almost kind of like an xy coordinate system here. When you have those 400, you're looking at dermal. As we go a little bit uh, higher in the wavelengths, we're going to look at more tissue and vascular aspects than bone and joint. Once we cross that threshold, we're looking a little bit more brain as the primary target. And as we go down into the real infrared spectrum, we're looking at deep brain tissue uh, is realistically our target for some of those different wavelengths. And then the top right hand corner you can see a good graphical illustration of the difference between a short wavelength and a long wavelength. So you see the penetration of that short wavelength is only about five millimeters. When we start looking at the distribution of that long wavelength you see that there's a whole lot more penetration of the longer wavelength. So power. How much tissue do we want to treat? That's the question we're going to ask ourselves. The power of light used in photoneuromodulation, now we're kind of focusing a little bit more on the neuro side of things, is about 1 milliwatt to 1,000 milliwatts per diode. Okay, so you're looking at about a 1 milliwatt to 1 watt spectrum. Outside of these thresholds, the light is either too weak to have any effect or so strong that harmful effects may actually outweigh the benefits, and this is from Chung in 2012. Um, power and time are inversely related to dosimetry, so the more power you have, the less time you'll treat for, but less isn't always more. 
right? Because we're going to talk in a minute about tissue capacitance. So tissue can actually store energy. So maybe longer is better. So as we just said, higher power isn't always better. Tissue can act as a capacitor. It actually stores energy over a period of time. Longer sessions, the same power can provide greater penetration without necessarily heating up the tissue as much. So higher power can produce more heat and causes a sharper hormetic curve. So everybody's familiar with that term of hormesis, right? Same thing we see with radiation, x-ray has a hormetic curve. Some of it's beneficial, some of it's detrimental. Light has the same exact curve. And here's a 3D rendering of that hormetic curve. And what you'll see there, at the 0.0 seconds with zero radiance, as you go up that uh, y-axis there, um, you're going to start seeing that power starts to increase. But look at the shape of the mountain, if you will. Look at the shape of the mountain uh, from one side to the other. And what you'll see is there's a sharp drop off with the higher power. And then if we look at that bottom right-hand corner, there's almost like a plateau at the top before it starts to drop off. So lower power is actually a little bit more forgiving if the dose calculations aren't actually right. And you'll see in just a moment how tricky it is to do some of these dosage calculations. Um, right now, the literature pretty well supports that a maximum tissue dosage for photoneuromodulation is about six joules per centimeter squared, but the average is about 2.2. So this is not what you're delivering from your instrument. We have to look at the perspective of the tissue we're trying to treat. So we're gonna work backwards in calculating some of our dosage. Dose is usually in joules, and a joule is one watt per second. That's the calculation of a joule. Here's what you need to be cautious of. When you're looking through your laser catalogs, most of the time, these devices are, are displaying their power in milliwatts, right? So a milliwatt is one one thousandth of a watt. So which means that when you do that conversion, you're actually looking at one one thousandth of a joule per second. Okay, so we have to make sure we take that into consideration because somebody can say, hey, my device is 2,500 milliwatts. And you say, whoa, that's pretty high. It's 2.5 watts, which is still significant, but just don't get caught up in the numbers. And this is where we kind of deconstruct things and be educated physicians and know what we're trying to accomplish with what we're doing. Coherence was another thing that we were talking about. Coherence is essentially the type of wavelength that you have. So lasers emit monochromatic, meaning one color, coherent wavelengths that are coherent in time and space. So you get this one beam, and that's it. When we start looking at low-level light therapy and things like LEDs, they're non-coherent, but they're also monochromatic. They have one color, but you see there's a bunch of different wavelengths. At the bottom right-hand corner, you see sunlight. It's, multi, it's, not, it's completely non-coherent, and it's multichromatic, so we have all of these different wavelengths there. And when you start looking at some of the research for Rojas in 2011, he pretty well said that um, both are effective. However, no non-coherence light seems to be able to affect nervous tissue a little bit better, specifically because you can have lower tissue or uh, energy densities with less heating and accomplish the, the task that you need to with neuromodulation. Pulse structure, another thing that we need to consider. So this can factor into your usable power calculations. So one way to look at this is a duty cycle. So if you have a pulse that's on 50% of the time and off 50% of the time, and they're advertising this is a 1,000 milliwatt uh, light source, what's your usable power? 500 milliwatts, because it's off 50% of the time and on 50% of the time. So a lot of times when we see some of these pulsed lights, we just have to be educated consumers and say, OK, what's your duty cycle? You know, how long is the laser on when I put turn it on? But some of the things that we need to really consider in calculations are what's called spectral width. It's just in camera terminology, it's the aperture. Or also with your pupils, it's the aperture. How wide is the actual light? Because the wider it is, the more it's going to affect the surface. And a lot of these calculations are in milliwatts per centimeter squared. So you want to ask them, well, how big is the beam? If you're telling me it's you know, 1,000 watts per millimeter squared and the light is only a nanometer thick, that's a really what? Low-powered light source. You can see where it starts to get so confusing, right? And, and what we can do is we can make this presentation available to you for the Carrick Institute. Happy for you guys to have it so you can review it. Um, I think that there was a lot of time put in, into this, so hopefully it'll be beneficial to you. 
But we also have to consider peak wattage, pulse width, uh, pulse frequencies, and there's some calculations there, and I'm, I'm kind of running a little lower on time that I wanted to, so I'm going to run through some of these things so we can get to the good juicy stuff. Um, however, one thing important on this slide is that pulsed photobiomodulation has been shown to be significantly more effective than constant waves. So a light that's always on is not as effective as pulsed. Now, they think the reason why is that little bit of time, because remember, the mitochondria, it's not like this fast, right? It's a lot faster than any of these lights can actually pulse with. So the thing is, is that if you have a constant light form, there's not really any time for that intracellular balance to occur and, and for there to be a rest period in between the stimulation. So any type of pulsation seems to be uh, more effective in the literature than constant. When you start looking at pulse, there's not a whole lot of literature surrounding how, uh, what frequency the light should pulse at. But there are some people that are getting a little creative here and saying, well, entrainment of wavelengths uh, of brain waves exists. This is the basis of neuromodulation, right? This is neurofeedback and things like that. We can entrain wavelengths. Well, if energy or electricity can entrain wavelengths, why can't light? If we're penetrating, which we've already established that we are, why can't the flickering of a light or a dose of energy uh, at a certain frequency, why can that not train wavelengths? So you can actually maybe use this as a prescription cookbook uh, for things that you're trying to target. So delta waves, looking at half hertz to three hertz associated with relaxation, sleep, empathy. So somebody that's really high, strung, anxious, maybe you want to pulse your laser between a half hertz or three hertz. Theta waves, three to eight, associated with creativity, imagination. Alpha waves, associated with the, the default mode network. This is the mo mode network that allows us to be present. It actually is one of the mode networks that are shown that learning or plasticity occurs the best in. Also with alertness and calmness. Beta waves associated with focus, judgment, decision making, problem solving. We all see patients that have some struggles in that area, so maybe that's something we want to uh, focus on. And gamma waves, which are associated with love, consciousness, and also gamma waves have actually been shown to turn on glial cells, which is kind of neat too because you can have an immunological influence using light waves. Okay, so dosimetry, let's work backwards. So let's just say our target for the sake of this example is the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And not for any reason, and as we go through this, what I don't want you to do is say, okay, Dr. A said the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex needs 264 joules, so that's what I'm gonna set my device at. This is a process by which we can break down how to calculate your dosage so you determine it. So the wavelength of 808 is, we see is greatest or, or greater or more effective than other wavelengths, so let's just say that's the wavelength that we're going to use. We know that the frontal bone transmits about 2% of the activity. Uh, we need to consider probably about 20% impedance for hair follicles, for tissue, melanin, things like that, um, for, and especially if somebody's not shaved. And our target dosage that we said is uh, at max six joules per centimeter squared, but we're gonna wanna shoot for 2.2. So we've got a math equation, 2.2 joules per centimeter squared, that's our target tissue um, radi oh, I'm sorry, uh, fluence, so we're gonna say if only 2% of the dose gets through, we're gonna have to multiply that times 50, right? And that equals 110 joules per centimeter squared. We're gonna give it an additional 20% for some interference with follicles and hair. So our estimated dosage is 132 joules per centimeter squared. Now we say our surface area that we're gonna treat is two centimeters squared. Maybe that's how big the aperture is of your light source. So what does that mean? If the dose that we had is 132 per one centimeter squared and we need to treat two, what do we need to do to our, double, to our dose? I just gave you the answer, right? We've got to double it. So 264 joules, that's what we want our, la our light source to put out. Okay, so to target the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we need 264 joules and needed to be spread over roughly a two uh, centimeter squared area. Uh, and need the, the, near, uh, the wavelength to be near infrared or infrared to greater than 750 nanometers. So let's talk about an instrument. Let's just say our sample instrument, no brands associated, uh, is 808 at a one watt per centimeter squared. It's pulsed at 20 hertz, 50% uh, duty cycle, which means that our effective output is 500 milliwatts per centimeter squared per second. Our aperture is two centimeters squared at the skin surface. So 
Pretty good, easy statistics. But what if we needed to hit four uh, centimeters squared? What can we do? There's two options, right? We could either move our light source or what else? Pull it away from the skin, right? Because the light projection is conical. So as you pull it farther away, the source is going to get bigger. But many types of non-coherent light follows the inverse square law of like x-ray. So for every time you double your distance, you have to double your power by four in order to get the same amount of energy hitting your source. So just something that you need to take into consideration. Uh, but that also depends on a lot of different things, your spectral bandwidth, the laser lens focus, things of like that, things you're going to want to ask the purchase your, uh, person you're, you're purchasing a, uh, a, a device from. So now we need to calculate time. So 264 joules is what we want. So looking at the bottom of the screen, joules is watts times seconds. So 264 joules times our effective dose, which is 500 milliwatts, times 1,000 to get it from milliwatts to watts means we need 528 seconds of stimulation, which is about 8.8 .8 minutes. Okay? So that's where you need to be in order to deliver the appropriate dose that's going to reach your target tissue. Do you see how we worked at the target tissue and went back? We just didn't go to a setting in our device that says brain, because that's not going to be the best thing for your patient. 